Good evening and welcome to tonight's Craw Lecture, our first of 2022. This series features acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some of the biggest questions of our time. Tonight, our speaker helps us understand how marine mammals undertake some of the most extraordinary migrations on the planet. How do they eat and avoid being eaten? How do they make behavioral decisions based on the ecology of their prey and predators? all while keeping within the defines of their physiological limits. Tonight, we will learn how by attaching electronic uh, instruments to seals, Assistant Professor Roxanne Beltran explores predator-prey interactions in the open ocean and their implications for o ocean health. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded and available later on the university's YouTube channel. Our conversation tonight will be moderated by Dan Costa. Dan Costa is a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology and the director of the Institute of Marine Sciences at UCSC. He joined the research faculty at UC Santa Cruz in 1993 and became a regular faculty member in 19, I'm sorry, 1983 and became a regular faculty member in 1991. His research on the physiology and ecology of marine animals uh, is focused on the physiology and ecology of marine mammals and seabirds. It focuses on adaptations of marine organisms to life in their marine environment, especially the movements foraging, ecology, and conservation. He has worked in the lab and field studying albatrosses, penguins, sea otters, dolphins, whales, sea lions, and seals. He's held the endowed chair in ocean health. He is particularly appropriate to introduce tonight's speaker since she was a postdoctoral researcher in his lab before she joined the faculty here at UCSC. Professor Costa, I will hand the program over to you. Thank you very much, George. It's, it's really a great pleasure to be able to introduce Roxanne. Uh, she's the newest member of the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department, uh, having joined the faculty just last year, as uh, George said, assistant professor. Roxanne received her bachelor's degree here at UC Santa Cruz, so she's a slug. She then went on to uh, the University of Alaska in Anchorage, where she did a master's of science degree. And from there, then she went on to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and did a PhD. While working uh, up in Alaska, she seemed to like these uh, high latitude cold environments. So her doctoral thesis was on working on Weddell seals in Antarctica. Uh, after she completed her doctoral dissertation, uh, she came to UC Santa Cruz and she was a recipient of the National Science Foundation and UC Chancellor's postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, she joined my lab and worked with Erica Zalvilletta and myself. Uh, she was then, as we said, as I said, uh, uh, joined our faculty. Here at UC Santa Cruz, she's developed a lab that has already brought together a really diverse group of graduate students, postdocs. And I think one of the things that's really exciting about what she's doing is, is she's doing what makes UC Santa Cruz special. That is, she's incorporating undergraduates in her research. Having just started her lab a little over a year ago, she already has 12 undergraduates that are assisting with her fieldwork. While most of Roxanne's research currently takes place at Año Nuevo, a reserve that's just up the coast from uh, up the coast here from us, just on the, the other side of the San Mateo border from Santa Cruz County, uh, she investigates the behavior and physiology and how these constraints and, and processes interact to drive the ecological and evolutionary patterns we see in nature. In addition to the other things that I've said about Roxanne, she's quite uh, accomplished for someone so young. She was a National Geographic Young Explorer. She is a recent recipient of the Beckman Young Investigator, Young Investigator Award. She also has a recipient of the Packard Fellow in Science and Engineering. She also has a regular, recently awarded a regular National Science Foundation uh, research grant. In addition to all these other uh, scientific pursuits, she and her husband, Patrick Robinson, have authored an award-winning children's book. It's titled A Seal Named Patches. It's, over, it's sold over 15,000 copies uh, worldwide, 
And as I said, it's already received several awards as, a, as an outstanding uh, children's book for natural history. Roxanne is passionate about the inclusion of marginalized students in scientific research. And as such, she's co-founded the UC Santa Cruz Building a Better F Fieldwork Future Program and is working towards making field settings safer, more equitable, and more welcoming to the next general generation of field scientists. And I would say this is something that's incredibly needed in the marine sciences. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to pass it the podium or whatever we have here over to Roxanne, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And um, thank you, George and Rave for the wonderful introduction. I feel really lucky to be here tonight. Um, I'm sorry that we can't all be together, but um, hopefully I can take you in this virtual realm out to the places that I feel really, really lucky to be able to work and share with you um, some of the research that I do. So I hope wherever you're watching from, you're staying safe and healthy and finding creative solutions to do what you love during this pandemic. Um, I wanna start by talking about the ocean and how special it is. It's fundamentally different from pretty much everything you and I experience in our day-to-day -day lives. There's not a thing in sight. There's no physical landmarks. There's no habitat characteristics, no man-made structures, nothing on the horizon out in the open ocean. It's very different from the coastal systems that you may have seen here on the Pacific coast, like the kelp forests and the rocky intertidal. And it's so distant from the research stations that we have that it's difficult to study. And as a result, there are a ton of fundamental questions about the marine environment that remain unanswered, like the movement of animals relative to their prey and predators. And this is especially true in the third dimension of the ocean. So like the mesopelagic and bathypelagic zones down to about 4,000 meters, um, these areas are devoid of light. They're limited in oxygen and we know very little about what's going on in these areas relative to nearshore regions. But fortunately, the development of instruments attached to animals, which is called biologgers, has opened up an entirely new toolkit for understanding animal movement and interactions in the ocean and beyond, like the global migrations of birds and mammals that you can see in this video. And animals can now carry these tiny sensors for measuring anything from behavior, like movement and diving patterns, to physiology, like heart rate and body temperature, to ecology, like predator-prey interactions, and even environmental characteristics, like noise pollution and light pollution. And it's incredible that these tags can tell us these things about how nature works. But there's just one problem, and that's that we have to actually attach these instruments to animals and ideally get the instruments back so that we can get the data back, which is quite difficult to do, as you can imagine, in the open ocean. Fortunately for us and for Dan Costa and for Bernie LaBeouf and all the people who work here on the Pacific coast on elephant seals, um, elephant seals come onto shore for a couple months per year right here on our coast. So this is a video taken by Patrick Robinson from his drone at Año Nuevo State Park. And you can see there's hundreds of seals resting on the beach recovering from their really long oceanic foraging migrations. And we can observe and handle the seals while they're on the beach. We can instrument them with sensors and then we can let them go explore the Pacific Ocean while collecting high resolution data. So most of my work happens here and focuses on how these animals make decisions like choosing between breeding and feeding, between surfacing and diving, between being awake and being asleep. So the talk today will be an adventure of sorts, taking you through how incredible and extreme these elephant seals are, and then showing you some hot off the press research summaries, then diving deep into one of my all time favorite case studies of research, which I like to call lightscapes of fear, and then giving you a sneak peek into our upcoming research projects um, and show you how you can follow along on those adventures. Undertakes its first migration out into the open ocean. And a subset of these seals are uniquely identified using plastic flipper tags so we can keep track of them year after year. So every year we induct about 300 new elephant seal pups into this research program. Basically after they've weaned from their moms and become independent, we can carefully capture them. We can weigh them to see how well their moms did at, at fattening them up during that lactation period. And then we can apply a set of uniquely numbered flipper tags to their rear flippers. So this becomes their identification number, essentially their identity for the rest of their lives because those flipper step tags stay attached to the seals year after year. And of course you can imagine standing at the colony of a thousand elephant seals, looking over a sea of flippers and sand being flung and lots of noises happening all around you. You can imagine it would be really difficult to find those flipper tags in a sea of animals. 
And so one of the things that we do to make that a little bit easier on ourselves is we actually add a mark to the side of each seal with that seal's flipper tag number. We use Clairol Nice and Easy Hair Dye on a wooden stamping stick. And that looks something like this. You just kind of write the number um, on that marking stick backwards and then just pop it onto the animal and that's it. Um, on a side note, if anyone has any connections to the folks at Clairol, we use Nice and Easy to Blue Black and it's a very expensive part of our research program. So <laughs> if you have any connections, definitely reach out because we'd love to get some hair dye donated. Um, but in all seriousness, this dye marking scheme helps us so much. It's a really tough job trying to find all these seals day after day after day on this colony full of a thousand animals. And so being able to have these numbers on the sides of the seals um, is really, really helpful. So after that happens, after animals have a flipper tag, when they have a mark, we're able to see them day after day, year after year, and produce these incredibly rich histories of where the animals are, you know, whether they have a pup, their exact pupping date, whether the pup is male or female, when the animals molt, and any comments or photos that give us extra information like wounds they may have or behaviors we might observe. So I'll give you this example. This is B95. Um, she was first observed as a female weanling in 2015. She's now seven years old. And you can see, based on the number of sightings per year, that we've seen her about 100 times. What that actually looks like is here. I don't expect you to read this, but just to show you how rich these histories are, every single one of these green rows is a sighting of her. Every blue row is a new year. So you can kind of see those chunks of years where she's been seen. She's been seen all the way from that first year she was ever seen as a pup all the way until now as a seven-year-old. So we've literally watched her grow up, um, produce her first pup, and then we can keep track of her to see how successful she is throughout her entire lifetime. So this demographic program that I'm describing was first um, started by Bernie LaBeouf in the 1960s and continued by Dan Costa for many years, and it's now in its sixth decade. So hundreds of people have done over 300,000 sightings of about 50,000 seals. And the information gained from this program is just amazing and absolutely Herculean effort by so many people. And it's really, really neat to be able to look back and see all these generations of, of seals on the beach right now. And one of the huge benefits of having all this information is that we can attach biologging devices to certain animals that have a higher probability of returning to Año Nuevo so that we can recover the data. So over the last 20 years, Dan Costa and his team of graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduate students have led this huge effort to instrument about 40 seals per year at Año Nuevo, where that star is, and found that they undertake these incredible migrations on their quest to find food like fish and squid out in the open ocean before returning to the Año Nuevo breeding colony. These seals are traveling up to 10,000 kilometers round trip and diving continuously, you know, from the surface of the ocean down to about 500 meters on average, holding their breath for 23 minutes, followed by just two minutes at the ocean surface to catch their breath and doing that over and over and over and over. Now, if I show you a calendar of their annual cycle, you can see that elephant seals have two foraging trips per year. We call them the long trip and the short trip. And they're interspersed by the breeding season where they give birth, nurse their pups, and then wean them in the molting season where they replace their fur every year. And throughout that annual cycle, elephant seals have limited time and energy and are therefore constantly facing trade-offs or decisions about how to spend that time and energy. So for example, elephant seals have to allocate time to either diving underwater for food or coming to the surface to breathe oxygen. This is just one example. But let's say an animal is at the surface of the ocean with full oxygen stores. The behavioral priority might be to dive for food. But on the other hand, when an animal has been diving for a super long time and its oxygen stores are depleted, it needs that breath of fresh air. The behavioral priority might be to surface for oxygen. So I'll use this sort of conceptual model of trade-offs throughout the talk to show that as these physiological and ecological processes shift in time or space, so to do behavioral decisions. This of course is a super simple case, right? In the wild, these animals are making decisions not just based on food and oxygen, but on predator abundance, on um, their fat reserves, on their reproductive state and many other factors. So my research group really focuses on um, understanding how animals make these behavioral decisions um, based on physiological and ecological processes using instruments attached to animals. And these are huge decisions with huge implications from 
on the migration scale, determining foraging success and pupping success to population level scales, which impacts the niche that elephant seals have evolved to exploit over evolutionary history. So now that I've set the stage with elephant seal natural history, I'd like to walk you through a few summaries of our hot off the press research. So these are things that either came out uh, were published in the last year or are in the process of being published now, beginning with a look into how seals make decisions during their very first few months of life. So the best place to study these trade-offs that I'm talking about are in the seals that operate closest to their limits, like young seals that have small, relatively small body sizes, um, less experience and reduced breath hold capabilities. So imagine you're this seal that's just been weaned from your mom and gotten no parental instruction whatsoever. Your mom has already left for her own foraging trip. She's just trying to feed and get nice and fat so she can produce another pup next year. So the question is, how do you prepare? What decisions do you make during the two months you spend on the beach after weaning and before that first migration? To answer this question, we partnered with National Geographic to attach uh, critter, critter cam video cameras to the backs of seals for a couple of days and then measured their behavior, like how much time they spent resting versus moving and in the water versus land. We did this for 11 seals for about 120 hours of footage and had a bunch of wonderful undergrads who were willing to score the videos and do independent research projects on this. And what we found is that these young seals, remember they're just about two or three months old at this point, spend an incredible amount of time resting, but they aren't just napping on the beach being lazy. They spend their naps doing a series of breath holds, training to dive, just like you and me would do short training runs for a marathon or an Ironman triathlon. And we actually measured heart rate using a small logger glued to the armpit, which showed us exactly what we expected. We found that their cycles of breathing and breath hold, which you can see here in red and blue, resulted in very clear patterns of increased and decreased heart rate, indicative of the typical mammalian dive response. And the more breath holds that these young seals did, the more their heart rate drops, which is an indication of physical fitness. Again, same as you and me, if I started training for a marathon right now off the couch, I would see my heart rate drop little by little every day to the point that I would see a really low heart rate in myself at the end of my training block, which is an indication that physiologically, I'm ready to go for that marathon. But the heart rates in these seals, despite getting better and better, were still much higher than older seals, suggesting that they hadn't fully developed their breath hold capabilities before they depart for that first trip to sea. Now, I thought it might be fun for us to compare our heart rates to that of a first year elephant seal. So if you're willing, um, let's all go ahead and measure our heart rates real quick. I guarantee you mine will be the fastest of anyone in this audience, but we'll see. So go ahead and take your index middle finger and put it on your carotid artery. Um, it should be right under your chin on the right side. You should feel a vein. I feel a nice fast heartbeat right now. Um, so when I say go, you'll count the number of heartbeats you feel until I say stop, say stop six seconds later. So go ahead and start. And stop. Now take that number and multiply it by 10. Go ahead and write it down if you want, but that is your heart rate in beats per minute. So Nikki, if you could please start our poll, hopefully we can find out from the audience what their heart rates are. Thanks. <laughs> Look at that nice normal distribution. <laughs> All right, so um, it looks like most folks are between 60 and 80 beats per minute. So actually right in line with, uh, with the young elephant seals that I'm showing here. But it looks like three people had heart rates of less than 40 beats per minute. I'm gonna guess those are athletes, super awesome, good for you. And I'm definitely one of the five people who was over 100 beats per minute. <laughs> so thank you all for sharing. All right, so the question becomes then, how does all of this hard work of breath hold training pay off for the seals during their first trip to sea? 
Um, I'll show you data from just one of the young seals. We have about 14 now that we've instrumented, which is amazing. And this particular seal carried a satellite tag. You can see her picture there. And she made it all the way to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and back without any prior experience or instruction from her mom, which is amazing. And my postdoc, Jaffer Juma, who's working on this project, plotted her track color-coded based on the number of days since departure. So you can see from red to yellow to green, um, the start, middle, and end of that trip. And if I overlay the dive data, you can see how she managed to find and capture enough fish and squid to survive her next year because her behavioral ADL, which is basically sort of an indication of how long she could hold her breath, increased throughout that trip. So she actually started at a pretty decent breath hold with about 13 minutes of breath hold during the first part of that trip. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely can't hold my breath for 13 minutes. Um, and then she increased her fitness throughout that trip such that by the end of the trip, she was holding her breath for about 28 minutes. So you can see from these data that their heart rates, their diving abilities, their navigation abilities, they're all developing super quickly during their first trip to sea, which is probably what allows them to survive that first trip. And it also begs the question of, how the seals managed to navigate back to the colony so precisely, both in space and in time. And that was the focus of another research project we have in press at Current Biology right now. So when we look at the larger data set of adult female biologging data, we can begin to sort of put more pieces of the puzzle together about the decisions that these seals make at sea. So it's pretty remarkable to me that the seals can be in the middle of the open ocean, you know, halfway between here and Japan, and know exactly how to navigate back to the breeding colony. So in this paper, which started as Alex Yuen's senior undergrad honors thesis and morphed into a joint publication, we asked a very simple but very important question, which is when do seals decide to uh, stop foraging, to turn around and to head back toward the breeding colony? And we discovered that seals foraging farther away decided to begin their inbound migration earlier, which implies that the seals know their distance to the breeding beach, even when they're thousands of kilometers away, and allocate extra time to get back if they have farther to travel. This is what's called a map sense in the navigation literature, and it basically suggests that seals have an internal GPS, which helps us understand how they manage their astonishing navigational feats. And this is something that had been determined in a couple species, but mostly raised in captivity or in these very experimental situations. And so to be able to show that definitively elephant seals in the wild have a map sense and can navigate using that map sense is uh, pretty incredible and exciting, I think. This finding also helps us understand how regardless of where seals feed, they all manage to make it back just in time for the breeding season. So in a separate paper led by Rick Condit, we used the same data set again to look at the precision of the migration return timing. So this top left figure is the same annual cycle I showed you before with one addition. You can see that orange slice at the top of the pie chart, which is the short gap of time between when the seals arrive at the beach from their foraging trip and when they give birth to pups. So by combining the flipper tag reset data and the biologging data, we figured out that after their 240 day foraging trip, they arrive on land with less than five days to spare before giving birth. This is an incredible finding because of course, just before that birth date, the seals are far offshore. This figure shows a map of um, tracking data relative to the Año Nuevo colony, which is the white square. And you can see that just a couple weeks before birth, the seals are around 1500 kilometers offshore. So they really do hustle back to return to that breeding colony right on time. In this case, the decision of when to turn around has important implications for the pup, right? Because you can imagine the adult females are pregnant. For the pup that they're gestating, that pup can't survive if it's born in the water. And so if the seals stay out in the water foraging for too long, the pup would be born in the ocean and would never be able to survive. So this is a really important way that elephant seals are able to ensure their reproductive success um, using navigation skills year after year. And these migration decisions also have implications for how much food they can eat and therefore how successfully they can nurse their pup. So this is what an adult female often looks like when she's leaving the breeding beach. Uh, she's you know, depleted lots of fat stores. And then when she comes back, all of a sudden she's a lot fatter because she's been feeding on these really energy rich fish and squid out in the middle of the North Pacific. And we can actually measure this foraging success 
by measuring her mass when she leaves the beach and measuring her mass again when she returns, which sounds like a really easy problem, right? But we can't ask the seals to step on the scale like you or me. These animals are, you know, 500 kilograms. So instead, it takes about five people and a bunch of heavy equipment to weigh the seal. So first what we do is we sedate each seal and then we carefully roll her into the sling that's made by the local awning company in Santa Cruz. And then we hoist her into the air in this tripod with a scale and come along suspended in the air until she's all the way up in the air. And then we can weigh her, uh, weigh all the gear, subtract that, and then we're able to measure mass. And so it's totally doable. It's a little bit challenging to have this many people and uh, this much equipment. So we wanted to see if we could use drones to estimate mass in an accurate way. Patrick and I worked with a really wonderful undergraduate student, Diane Alvarado, to use a drone to take overhead photos of seals and then use photogrammetry where the size of an object can be basically measured in relation to a scale bar in a photo. So for 55 seals, Diana measured the footprint of the seals by tracing their perimeters, as you can see here, which we call the footprint of the seal, and also weighed each seal using the tripod and sling method I showed you before. And she found that there was a very strong relationship between seal footprint and measured mass with only 5% error. So we were pretty excited about this because we think it will save us and other researchers a ton of time and money and will also help us minimize animal disturbance. Imagine weighing a seal without even touching it or even being able to trace and therefore measure all the seals on the beach to get a whole colony measurement. Um, the prospects with this method are, are sort of endless and we're very excited about that. Okay, so now that I've shown you how elephant seals carefully manage their decisions to maximize reproductive and foraging success, and also talk to you through some of the tools that we use like biologging devices and mark recapture techniques and photogrammetry, I'll show you one of my favorite research projects of my career so far, which is combining these methods to look at life and death in the open ocean and specifically how body condition plays a really important role in driving risk taking in these migratory elephant seals. So I wanna take a step back here and introduce you to one of my favorite activities, which is sleeping. Um, as you probably are well aware, um, all animals, including humans, have to stop foraging and reproducing and molting at some point to rest and recover. So rest is assumed to be a behavior of increased risk of predation for wild animals due to reduced or absent vigilance. And so resting animals often exhibit strategies for minimizing this predation risk. So for example, many animals change the timing the social dynamics and the location of their rest by resting at night, resting in groups, or resting in safe spaces like nests and burrows. So our research team, led by our wonderful undergraduate student mentee, Shauna Shukla, with Marm Kilpatrick, reviewed the literature to see which of 127 mammal species use which of these three resting strategies. So each species here in this phylogeny is a row, and the yellow, teal, and blue squares indicate the presence of each resting strategy for each species. So we found that resting strategies vary really strongly with body size and habitat, but that temporal resting strategies, like resting in the safety of darkness at night, were by far the most common across mammal species. And this is true for elephant seals as well. They have no access to safe resting grounds and do not rest in groups out in the open ocean when they're vulnerable to predation, which means that changes in the timing of their sleep are the only defense they have against predators in the open ocean. And I've mentioned this before, but animals have to decide how to use their time. So do they rest? Do they eat? And these behavioral decisions reflect trade-offs between physiological and ecological processes. So we've seen time and time again that bringing animals into captivity like zoos or aquariums, for example, releases them from ecological selection pressures and almost always leads to immediate changes in sleep timing. Similarly, seasonal changes in day length and limitations in food can also induce changes in the activity timing of wild animals. And in theory, animals in poor body condition should prioritize acquiring resources over avoiding predators. But there's sparse empirical evidence to support this idea due to the difficulty of measuring body condition in free ranging animals. So the aim of our research was to gain a more comprehensive understanding of how body condition influences sleep timing and the resulting predation risk in wild animals. We explored this question in, drum roll please, 
northern elephant seals um, doing their seven month oceanic migration. So we instrumented 71 adult females with a satellite tracker for transmitting location data, an archival time depth recorder that basically measures light level and depth every four seconds, and also a jaw accelerometer that measures prey capture attempts. So to give you an idea of what these high resolution dive data look like, here we have depth on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Depth is going down, so the top of the plot is the surface of the ocean, going down to about 400 meters. And I'll show you what a foraging dive looks like. So seals start at the surface, dive down, chase fish up and down in the water column, then come back up to the surface, versus a resting dive, sometimes called a drift dive, in which they're at the surface, they actively swim down, then drift in the water column, then swim back up for their breath of fresh air. And we can use these, these resting dives to not only tell when they're resting, but also how fat they are throughout this entire seven month migration. And that's because we can use the change in depth over the change in time as a proxy for buoyancy and therefore convert that into percent fat on a daily basis. So you can imagine that skinny seals are very lean. They sink in the water column. Um, fat seals float in the water column and the degree to which they sink, float or are neutrally buoyant gives us a precise metric of how fat the seals are. So we can combine these two data streams, um, the timing of their rest and also the percent fat during those days to figure out exactly how their percent fat changes their resting timing. So throughout these long distance migrations, elephant seals are either foraging or sleeping. And we know that foraging confers high reward, right? As animals can take in energy, whereas resting is high risk because seals like us sleep with both hemispheres of their brain. And so they sort of lack the ability to detect and avoid their predators, which are predominantly thought to be great white sharks and killer whales. So every minute of every day, these elephant seals have to decide what to do. Do they forage for fish or do they avoid predators um, or do they rest underwater? And the biologers attached to the seals can tell us exactly what they're doing. They can also tell us when they're doing those behaviors. So in addition to depth, these tags measure light level, which is a really valuable proxy for risk because the known predators of elephant seals um, are silent visual predators that rely on light level to find prey. So that's usually during the daytime. So for example, we can use the tagging data to tell us whether the seals are experiencing daytime or nighttime with daytime being more risky and more uh, predator abundance and nighttime being more safe. And of course, where they do those things in the water column. The ocean has a third dimension and light attenuates really quickly at depth, meaning that shallower waters with more sunlight are also more risky. So given that, we can use this combination of behaviors with rest being more risky and when the animals are doing those behaviors with daytime being more risky and where they're doing those behaviors with shallow waters being more risky to understand how predation risk varies across these trips. We use light as a proxy for risk, and we call that the lightscape of fear because light integrates across three-dimensional space and time. So I'll show you uh, the results that we found. We wanted to figure out uh, how predation risk and energy reward vary as a function of time since sunrise. So in all of these plots, dark blue is nighttime and yellow is daytime. And the x-axis here is time. So this is hours after sunrise with the negative numbers being before sunrise during nighttime and the positive numbers being after sunrise or daytime. And so of course, risk, which is light level, increases throughout the day and is highest during the daytime. That means that in theory, elephant seals should sleep at night when the risk or probability of being detected by predators is theoretically lower. We also looked at foraging success across the same time period um, in terms of hours after sunrise and found that um, based on jaw, jaw accelerometers, foraging success is highest at night, which also means that seals should eat at night. So taken together, these two things mean that seals have competing priorities. They both want to eat and sleep at night. And of course, that is not possible. They have to choose. So our question became, what do the seals prioritize? Do they sleep or feed at night? And how does that change with their body condition? So to test this, we plotted a time series of rest timing, which is on the y-axis. Again, here, daytime is yellow, nighttime is blue, across that whole seven month foraging trip. And you can see that early on in the trip, the seals rest predominantly during the daytime when light levels are high and risk is high. And then throughout the trip, they rest earlier and earlier relative to sunrise such that most of their um, resting occurs in the safety of darkness. 
Now, if I add in the data for body condition changes across that same time period, you can see that the shift in rest timing corresponds really well with the increase in body fat gain throughout the trip. So in other words, as seals become more and more fat throughout that foraging trip, they rested progressively earlier relative to sunrise, which minimized the overall risk exposure. Basically becoming more fat allowed them to rest in a less risky way. And instead of plotting these two metrics across time, if we plot them against each other, you can see the same thing, that fat seals rest more at night and skinny seals rest more during the day. So I interpret this as a body condition mediated rest timing, meaning that skinny seals are basically more likely to take risks. But remember up until this point, we're using light level as a proxy for risk without actually measuring mortality events. So we validated this proxy by comparing the proportion of satellite transmissions, so basically location transmissions, that occurred during the daytime versus nighttime to the proportion of mortality transmissions for seals that stopped transmitting and never returned to the beach and were thought to have been predated upon. And we found that seals were significantly less likely to die at night than by random chance, which basically confirms this idea that high light levels during the daytime present a risk to migrating seals. And this evidence of fat dependent risk taking did not just stop at these time activity budgets it continued to vertical space use as well. So here I'm showing percent lipid on the x-axis and depth of these rest dives on the y-axis with the surface of the ocean again at the top of the plot going down to about 400 meters. And so you can see that regardless of time of day, fat seals always started resting deeper than skinny seals. And then for a given percent fat, seals always rested deeper during the day than during the nighttime. Now, if I add the approximate light levels for each time of day and depth combination, you can see that by strategically using vertical space, the seals are basically able to modify the light levels to which they're exposed and therefore modify the risk of predation. So this is what we call the lightscape of fear, which we continue to consider to be um, analogous to the landscapes of fear paradigm in ecology. Now I'm going to show you a one and a half minute summary animation that my co-author, Jesse Kendall Barr, who's a graduate student with Dan Costa and Terry Williams, um, put together to communicate this science. And this animation, I should say, is part of a publication she recently came out with called Visualizing Life in the Deep, which is a really um, beautiful combination of, of art and science. So I'll let this animation play. All right, so hopefully today I've shown you how biologgers can help us understand species interactions in ways we never really imagined before. These day-night cycles, like I talked about, have such fundamentally important constraints on really every facet of animal biology, from perception via sensory systems, like whether animals use uh, vision or hearing predominantly, to diving physiology to species interactions. And I want to highlight four key questions that I think could guide our understanding of these constraints. 
So first, I think we need to think more deeply about how to actually measure light exposure of individual animals in situ. This is often done using location trackers that then we extract light data, but that doesn't take into account microhabitat characteristics and all sorts of things um, that light very clearly uh, changes with. Second, I think we can use biologgers on both prey and predators to understand how food availability and predation risk differ between day and night and what that means for the evolution of obligate diurnal and nocturnal strategies. Third, I think we can study the impacts of these changes in day length experienced by species in polar regions like the Antarctic or in highly migratory species, especially for predator prey interactions. So for example, do longer day lengths favor species that feed during the day, but punish species that feed at night? And lastly, I think we can determine the predominant causes of mortality and learn how light level plays a role in these selection pressures. We clearly have a lot to learn, but hopefully advancements in biologging can help us piece together some of these puzzles. So light is clearly important for animals and humans make artificial light, which means we have the ability to disrupt animals and species interactions that have developed over evolutionary time. So this is a recent review paper that shows the proportion of, of studies that found that artificial light created by humans at night influences things like activity patterns and life history traits and physiology and community level um, factors in wild animals. So for example, every year billions of birds migrate north um, and they use the night sky to navigate. And so as they pass over big cities on their way, they can become disoriented. So there's a movement toward decreasing the amount of light our residential and commercial buildings emit, which not only reduces unnecessary mortality and behavioral changes in wild animals, but also gives us uh, reductions in energy consumption, it saves us money, it supports our sustainability goals. And so I encourage you to look into how you might reduce your impact on the daily and seasonal cycles of these, of these wild animals. And I want to conclude with a sneak peek into future research and uh, let you know how you can follow along. So we have this Facebook page, facebook.com slash research um, that Patrick Robinson posts regular research and field updates. Um, so I encourage you to follow along there and ask whatever questions you have. He's uh, very responsive. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. And if you aren't sick of elephant seals yet, at this point in the talk, we have um, a new PBS episode being broadcast nationwide tonight at 8 p.m. Pacific time, which showcases our collaboration with the BBC's custom camera crew. Um, we worked with them to develop and deploy a new camera for studying what these young seals are doing during their first couple months on the colony. And I think you'll really enjoy the, the footage that came off of those cameras. This is also a really exciting time to follow along because um, our instrumented adult female seals are just now returning from their seven month migrations to give birth to pups at Ani Nuevo. Um, so on the left, you can see the full tracks. On the right, you can see the zoom in of where the seals were last night. Um, so five are already on the beach of which three, actually four have now given birth to pups and we'll sedate those adult females and recover their instruments in the next few days. And as of January 15th, based on the census done by Pat Morris, there are 1200 seals on the beach, including 662 females and 266 pups. And that is increasing exponentially by the day. It's also an exciting time to follow along because we have a few new research projects um, on the horizon that I'm super excited about. So I've talked today almost exclusively about female elephant seals, but male elephant seals are important too. <laughs> um, they're an amazing example of how differences in size between males and females can result in really different physiological and energetic constraints and different behaviors, as well as different exposures to different risks and rewards. So basically for males, sexual selection, especially in very polygynous breeding systems where one male mates with multiple females, there's a strong sexual selection pressure pulling male body size larger, whereas natural selection is probably pulling male body size smaller. So there's this tug of war, this sort of trade-off um, that relates strongly to breeding systems. And so if we look at elephant seals, for example, compared to other phocid seals, we see that they're the most sexually sized dimorphic and they're also um, they have this sort of rare breeding strategy of copulating on land. Whereas compared to the sea lions and fur seals called odoriads, um, all of them copulate terrestrially and many of them are more sexually sized dimorphic than many of the phocids. So we can do these really interesting phylogenetic sort of studies to see how these sorts of strategies evolve and what that means for the ecology and evolution 
of these animals. So over the next three years, we'll be instrumenting and sampling juvenile elephant seals ages zero through four, both male and female. So we can basically watch them grow up and understand when and why males and females diverge in their size and their physiology and their behavior and their ecology. And then more broadly start to understand the causes of mortality at sea. In a separate grant, we're working with Holger Klink at Cornell University and my graduate student, Allison Payne, to create a seal-proof acoustic recorder that elephant seals can hopefully carry out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean to quantify the soundscape. Um, so during this short foraging trip for about 24 animals over three years, we're hoping to detect sperm whales and beaked whales and to measure the behavior of those whales by quantifying their vocalizations like buzzes and clicks um, to see not just where they are, but also how often they're foraging. And thanks to a fellowship from the Packard Foundation, we're sort of extending this work to measure the physical and biological oceanography, as well as fish abundance, to see how um, the distribution of whales relates to those factors. So basically, we're partnering with elephant seals and leveraging their incredible ability to find productive areas in the ocean to do some ecosystem monitoring that's critical so we can begin to understand the effects of climate change. Um, using seals as smart sensors, I think, is just the beginning of an idea with an ending that's super unwritten. So what types of biologgers should we put on elephant seals? You know, new loggers are being developed every day. Should we try to measure harmful algal blooms from the backs of seals? Should we use echo sounders to measure prey abundance? Should we measure ocean acidification using pH sensors? I think the, the opportunities here are endless and I'm very excited to pursue them over the next few decades. So I'll end today with the same slide I started with and say that the ocean is this incredible vast space that I think is, is really waiting to be discovered. I think I've given you a small taste of what elephant seals can tell us about risk and reward in the open ocean. And I can tell you that the principles of ecology that I told you about today are all around you. You don't have to go searching for them in the open ocean. So I encourage all of you to look for these patterns in your day-to-day -day lives during the next you know, low tide scramble down to the rocky intertidal and watch a tide pool for long enough and I guarantee you'll see predation in action or go watch whales off the coast and notice how their body size is so huge you could never weigh them unless you measured their body mass using a drone. Or if you can make it out to Anya Nuevo and watch an elephant seal come onto the shore, think about the incredible journey that she just undertook while pregnant, trying to avoid sharks and killer whales and recalculating her navigation route um, back to shore. It's pretty incredible, um, this natural world and the animals that live in it. And I think we should all feel very lucky that, that we get to observe it in the way that we can. So with that, I wanna thank all of the people who contributed to this work, um, to Dan Costa, who believed in me when I was a very young undergraduate student, um, and to this day is always available for brainstorming or strategy, strategy sessions. Um, to Patrick, who's my partner in crime, and basically, <laughs> Dan was saying, the air traffic control of Anya Nuevo, really coordinating everything. Um, to Rick Condon and Bernie LaBeouf, who were there at the beginning and really poured their hearts and souls into this program. Um, to the current field leaders, to Rachel, Teresa, Irina, Claire, and Jesse, who are dedicated, capable, amazing field researchers and mentors, and who've stepped up immensely during this pandemic to find solutions for making the program work. Um, to the hundreds of volunteers who've contributed to these field efforts over the last six decades, including our current cohort of 16 volunteers, mostly undergraduate students who just inspire us every day with their great questions about research, their commitment to the program, and uh, most importantly, in this last couple of years, their persistence through what has proven to be very difficult years of a mostly remote college experience. To the funders who encourage us to take risks and dream big, um, to our science communication partners, the docents at Anya Nuevo State Park, the Friends of the Elephant Seal, and the Seymour Marine Discovery Center, um, and to our EEB community who supported us intellectually and beyond. And Last but not least, to my family, both biological and scientific, for making all of this so fun. Uh, I feel really grateful to have such a bright, hardworking community with which to share this work. So um, thank you to all of them, and thank you to you for being here. I really appreciate it and hope to meet you all in person sometime when this pandemic ends. <laughs> Thanks. So Dan, I think we have a few questions. Yes, we do. And I've been I sort of answering the easy ones and saving the good ones for, for Roxanne. Roxanne, thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. And I could just tell you a lot of the questions are uh, very insightful. I'll just start with the first one. How long does it take a female elephant seal to travel 1,500 kilometers? 
in order to reach the beach at Año Nuevo? Yeah, it's a great question. One we wanted to include in that current biology paper, but didn't have the space to do. Um, elephant seals have a maximum transit speed of about 120 kilometers per day, which if you do the math is, is really astonishing that they can keep up that speed. Um, but 1500 kilometers, you know, divided by 100, it's about, it's about that many days, so 15 days if I'm doing the math right, um, which is how they're able to get back even when they're 1500 kilometers away, 15 days before birth. Um, but that is like max speed. So when they're foraging, they have these very circuitous kind of slow meandering paths where they're finding patches of food and consuming them. And then at some point they give up and try something else. And, um, and so they don't keep that max speed up for the whole trip, but they can move pretty quickly when they need to. So the next question is, does arrival at the breeding beach influence the timing of birth, giving them some flexibility in terms of successful arrival? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. Um, we were asked by the one of the reviewers of that publication, uh, what was, you know, is a chicken or an egg question? Do they hit the beach and then give birth because all of a sudden gravity exists for them and, and you know, it induces the birth process or is it that they're arriving just in time to be able to give birth we don't know for sure there's a lot we don't know about the sort of reproductive anatomy and physiology of these animals but um what we do know is that the animals definitely speed up when they're further away they don't just turn around earlier but they also uh, swim a lot faster in order to get back so we think they have some perception of time and it's not just a perception of of raw time like you know it's eight o'clock on a monday it's a perception of time relative to when they got pregnant or when they need to give birth. And that is most likely what's driving those patterns, but um, we'll have to do some more exploring to come up with definitive answers for that. So a good question for you is, at what depth do they find the most food? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And it, it varies really widely. You know, one of the things I didn't get to talk about today because I didn't have time is just the incredible phenotypic flexibility or the individual variability in where these animals are going. Like if you look at that, the tracking map, it's not that all elephant seals are feeding in the same place. Some of the adult females go up, you know, to coastal Oregon, then coastal Washington and kind of hug the coast all the way up to Canada. Some go pretty much directly due west, stay in warmer waters. And then, you know, there's all sorts of females in between. And the beauty of Dan doing so much work over the last few decades is that there are how many tracks, Dan? Like a thousand tracks now. Yeah. A thousand tracks, which allows you to not just make these determinations based on 20 individuals, which is what we have to do in some species of marine mammals. But in elephant seals, it's really allowed us to explore this individual variability and see, you know, not just how does one individual vary across years, but also how do those individuals vary relative to each other. And so I think, you know, to the question about where they find the most food, at which depth they find the most food, it varies hugely by where they go and also what season it is. Um, they're following the diurnal vertical migration of their prey. So they're feeding um, on prey that are more shallow at night and more deep during the day. And that again is part of this whole lightscapes of fear paradigm that we're trying to sell, which is that even not just the seals, these sort of top, top predators, but the intermediate trophic levels are using light as this really important cue to you know, avoid predation risk by the seals. And so they're literally going down into deeper waters during the day to avoid those high lit waters where seals are more successful at foraging. So, you know, the answer is <laughs> somewhere between, you know, 300 and 700 meters probably, but um, there's also some really cool work by collaborators looking into specifically how prey size and more importantly, prey, the ability for prey to escape varies with depth and all of the different physical characteristics that vary with depth, like the dissolved oxygen and the temperature. And um, there's some interesting findings. I won't spoil them all because that should be another talk, but um, a lot of very cool stuff coming up in the next couple of years. So here's a good one for you is, do the seals have an optimum fatness? And can you say how they value life versus fatness? Yes, there's definitely um, two fat. And there's definitely not fat enough. Um, there's work, Dan, you know the paper better than me, so you should talk about Taiki's paper, but um, Taiki Adachi, who's coming in as a uh, assistant project scientist in our labs soon here, um, did his dissertation on elephant seals uh, at an institute in Japan. And he 
basically found that um, there was a cost to being too fat in elephant seals, which makes sense if you think about it. You know, buoyancy is a really, really big deal for these animals. And so just being a little bit off neutral buoyancy can cause a huge increase in the amount of energy that these animals have to spend to get down to depth. So um, I don't know exactly what the percent fat is that's optimal, but we do see that when the young seals go in the ocean for the first time, they are way too fat. <laughs> Their moms have just pumped them full of milk and they literally like, they're like bobbing corks. They can't even get down 10 meters. And so part of the reason we think they stick around on the beach for two months after weaning before their first trip is actually to lose some of that fat so that they can actually get down to depth and not just be shark bait at the surface of the ocean. <laughs> Dan, is there anything you wanted to add about Taiki's paper? Basically, the best thing is to be neutrally buoyant. And as you deviate away from that, there's a cost. But uh, it's like what you talk, your whole basis is it's a trade offs. So you want to have fat to be able to build up that extra energy reserves, but you also want to be neutrally buoyant. So you're not fighting against that extra buoyancy. So it's a, it's a trade off, just like your, your whole lecture tonight. Yeah, it's, it's a really fine line, I think, that the seals are walking. And it's not something that we can understand because we have you know, if the world is at the tip of our fingertips, we can order things, you know, online and they are delivered in 20 minutes. That's an exaggeration. But imagine, you know, if the seals are having to leave their foraging ground, knowing that they won't get food for 30 days straight as they transit back to the breeding colony and trying to figure out if they have enough fat reserves to get them through the breeding period. That's the calculations that the seals are having to do. And I think that's pretty impressive. So here's one that we should have Jesse answer, but I'll give it to you is, can you elaborate on those sleep cycles? Are, are the seals able to stay underwater and asleep longer than the 20 minutes when diving awake? Do they have an option to sleep in the surface in order to get longer stretches of sleep? Yeah, I'll try to answer without giving away Jesse's whole dissertation. <laughs> so Jesse Kendall Barr is a PhD student. She's the one who created that animation and uh, science communication is sort of what she does as her passion project on the side, but what she's doing for her dissertation is developing an EEG logger, so basically a brain logger that can measure sleep in wild animals in a non-invasive way, which she's worked so hard for so long with Dan and Terry to figure out. And I'm not going to give away the punchline, but I will say that, um, yeah, the seals sleep in very short amounts of time and for very little every day. And it's really impressive that they can get away with like one tenth the amount of sleep that we can. Um, I'll, I'll save that for her big paper, but I will also say that we do see seals do some extended surface intervals, what we call them. So like they'll come up from a dive and spend a couple hours on the surface. And one of the drawbacks of these sort of traditional biologgers, like the time depth reporters is that we only see behavior <laughs> in this one dimension. So we only see depth. So we know they're at the surface for two hours, but we don't know what they're doing. We don't know what their heart rate is. We don't know three axis acceleration. So we don't know like which way they're facing. We don't know how much they're moving. Um, so it's possible that they sleep at the surface. And that's one of the really um, useful things I think that Jesse's instrument will allow us to determine is whether they're only sleeping on these rest dives at 300 meters below the ocean surface, or if they're actually you know, sleeping during these extended surface intervals. They don't do them very much. And I haven't looked at the data enough to see if there's a consistent pattern when they happen. But I will say, I think they're probably a little short on sleep during these long trips, because if you've ever been to the beach at Año Nuevo right after they come back, they are doing a lot of sleeping, kind of like the, the winter break version of we get done teaching or taking classes and then like hibernate for two weeks straight. So I think there's probably some of that going on. Yeah, I will say that when we first started working on the elephant seals on the beach, we thought they were awfully lazy. Then we got their first diving records back and we said, okay, they've earned that rest on the, that time on the beach to sleep. That's right. So another question really relevant is, are seals at risk to the environmental change, such as reductions in food in their foraging grounds? Yeah, you know, a couple of different people have looked at that question in a couple of different ways, tried to see if elephant seals are at risk from climate change impacts. In theory, they are. I mean, you know, they're feeding on these, what we call ectothermic prey. So these are prey that basically like rely on temperature for their performance and therefore usually try to stay at around the same temperature. So as the oceans warm, it's expected that these fishes and squid will move northward into the colder waters or will move deeper into the colder waters or some combination of both. So you can imagine 
you know, if the elephant seals are having to travel farther north to find their food or having to dive deeper to find their food, they're expending extra energy and that could potentially have an impact. Um, I would say we can highlight two pieces of research that have actually empirically happened on that. One was a quantitative study by Elliot Hazen, who's a research scientist at NOAA and also affiliated with UC Santa Cruz, who did this really elegant um, paper in was, uh, Nature Climate Change, yeah. um, modeling different top predators and trying to predict basically how their habitat would change under climate change scenarios. And uh, elephant seals were one of the more robust species compared to other large marine vertebrates, which makes sense um, given that they have so many fat stores on board. You know, they're not like a sea lion, like an income breeder that just has, you know, a little bit of fat and goes on these foraging trips frequently. Elephant seals are, are pretty like substantial in that they store that capital for a really long period of time and therefore have a buffer against those sorts of things. So um, there was not a huge impact there. And then Rachel Holzer, who just finished her PhD in Dan Costa's lab, and is now a postdoc, um, looked at how the, um, the blob anomaly that happened here influenced both the behavior and the foraging success of adult female seals out right in the middle of the blob. And um, again, I don't want to spoil her science, I will say. Um, there's an interesting paper that will be coming out relatively soon, but um, she found some behavioral changes, but not a whole lot of impact either in terms of body condition gains or in terms of like fitness consequences, like reproductive success. Um, or survival. So it looks like elephant seals are pretty robust. And in terms of climate change, they're probably a better model system for understanding how these things work than, you know, an actual like species that we need to study because they're at risk of extinction. But that being said, anything can happen. Things change really quickly. And these tipping points are, are not a joke. So um, we're trying to find out as much as we can to be able to make those predictions into the next few decades. So we've had several people ask this, and I, there's the one, the question that you and I get all the time, I'll let you answer it. How do you think they navigate? <laughs> Where is Patrick when you need him? Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so Patrick Robinson's dissertation was, um, was on navigation, and um, he is going to publish the paper this summer, I suspect. But um, there are many hypotheses as to how elephant seals navigate. None of them seem plausible by themselves. So some examples are like, you know, using, sorry, Patrick, if I completely butcher this, um, using, you know, physical landmarks, using uh, celestial cues, you know, using the, the moon or the sun or the stars or whatever, um, using magnetic cues, which is, I think, kind of thought to be one of the more favorite cues that they're using. Um, and it seems like there's probably not one cue that they're using. And this has been found in other animals. Like if you remove, experimentally remove one sensory system by, for example, like temporarily blindfolding an animal that they'll kind of use a different sensory system to be able to navigate. Um, so Patrick tried a couple things experimentally in his dissertation and um, it, it doesn't, there's no obvious answer to that question. Um, I will say we see some weird stuff sometimes. Like we actually, a few days ago, I have a picture and then decided not to uh, show it because it's kind of gruesome. We found an elephant seal on the beach, adult female who had been bitten by a shark on the face. And it basically like sort of punctured both of her eyes and she can no longer see at all. Um, but she managed to make it to the beach on February, uh, sorry, January 15th. And on January 17th, she had produced a pup and appears to be raising that pup totally fine, despite not being able to see at all. So we're really curious to see what happens with her and to see if her lack of vision now with that shark bite wound um, will result in her being able to navigate or not. Um, that'll be kind of an experiment that we could never actually do, but that'll be a really interesting natural experiment. Um, so yeah, that was a long way of saying we have no idea how they navigate, but um, we think it's some combination of cues and there's a lot more work that needs to be done. This is a timely question. How are seals impacted by events like the recent tsunami? Are there any observations of behavioral changes in advance of such an event? I figured you'd like that one. All right, you guys, I'll show you the slide. I put it together and I was excited and then thought it was too gruesome, but I'm, I'm taking it back. Um, so let me find it real quick. Can you see that okay, Dan? Yeah. Okay, so this is the seal. This is my wonderful field technician, Claire, who sent us an email called Unusual Observations, Extreme Eye Injury and Tsunami. Claire had a very uh, challenging day in the field on the 15th. 
but you can see here, this is the adult female with, with that eye scarring. And then this is a picture of her just two days later, um, nursing a pup and that wound has healed pretty well. And then this is a video of the tsunami, um, the tsunami and the high tide sort of conflated in a way that was not ideal. And of course it's early breeding season. So a lot of the females have these really young pups. You can see those pups on the left are like probably between two and eight days old. Um, and so you can see the waves coming in and there are these really long period kind of substantial waves and the seals are not exactly happy about it, but some of them move a little bit up. Um, nothing really catastrophic happened. And we were a little bit worried to come back for field work, I think the day after the tsunami and we were scared all the pups were gonna be shuffled around and that there would be a lot of orphans. And, you know, there were some like more, more than average on a, on a given normal day, but um, it was not catastrophic in the way that it could have been. Um, there are often a king tide or two that happen during the breeding season. And when a king tide happens during the early season, it can be pretty catastrophic. And we've seen these kind of biggest incidents where like a big log will come in and kind of roll the seals around and the pups don't know how to swim yet. They really don't get in the water until after they wean at about a month old. So the pups are definitely not prepared for that sort of water. And I think they, they've done relatively well with the tsunami, but um, it was a bit of a crisis avoided kind of situation on the beach. So here's another good question is of all the female elephant seals that leave to forage, how many actually return? <laughs> That's a good question. And it's very dependent on um, all of the metrics I told you that we measure as part of the demographic program. So of the kind of prime age females with really good reproductive histories, um, which is the animals we try to target because the instruments are, you know, between five and $10,000 each. And so we don't want to put them on animals that aren't going to come back. Um, those kind of, I would call them, I'm not going to call them high quality, but those females with those characteristics come back with like a 95% return rate. So for example, we deployed 13 instruments on seals in June and of the ones coming back right now, it looks like only one or two didn't make it out of 13. So it's a, it's a really high ratio. Um, that is not the case for the young animals. So marine mammals are, they have a survivorship curve that basically the highest mortality is when they're youngest. And then as they get older and older, they have more and more chance of, of surviving. So um, during that first trip to sea, about 50%, five zero percent of pups die and never come back. Um, and then another, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20% emigrate to other colonies. So our green flipper tag seals will go down to St. Simeon to go say hi to the friends of the elephant seal, or we'll go to, you know, Point Reyes or um, the Farallon Islands. Sometimes they emigrate back, but other times they don't. So um, I would say mortality between, you know, five and 50% per year, depending on the demographic characteristics of the animals. So here's one that uh, is very relevant to people. Uh, and at Ayanoivo, it's not as much of a problem, but increasingly elephant seals do come ashore in a variety of places. So the question is, I've heard that people should avoid walking near elephant seals on the beach and that they are pretty fast moving. Is that accurate? How close could, should a person get to them? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, elephant seals, you know, we see them on beaches all the time. You know, I'll be, the other day I was walking my dog at Greyhound Rock and there was a log and then I realized the log was an elephant seal. And so I immediately backed up. Um, there are lots of rules and regulations and they're different for different places in terms of how much space you should give an animal. But I think a very good rule of thumb is that if you are making the animal do something that it wasn't otherwise going to do, then you're too close. So if you're 50 feet away, but you have a huge camera and a, you know, a flash on it and you're taking pictures and the seal's looking at you and wondering what your alien beam is doing, looking down on them, then you're probably too close or doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, we try to give them 20 to 50 feet if we can, the more space you can give them, the better, you know, they're just trying to get a rest in between all of these crazy life history events that they have. So um, the more space we can give them, the better. And I would say that's especially true for animals with like shark bite wounds. We're seeing a lot of shark bites this year and a lot of animals with kind of like torn off pieces of flesh. And, you know, those animals are spending a ton of their energy just trying to heal and survive. So the more space you can give them, the better. Here's a good one. What we noticed the numbers, we noticed the numbers stamped on the seals when at Greyhound Rock last week. Yeah. Yeah. Is, <laughs> Is there a way to use the number to follow a seal, a website that shows what, where the numbered seals are at any given time? Totally. I'm laughing because 
we literally saw that seal, took a picture, put it immediately in the database. And then when we got back, Patrick had a couple emails in his inbox from people with that exact sighting of that exact seal at Greyhound Rock. Um, right now, the database is researchers only with a few very small exceptions. And we are working toward a public facing searchable database where you, anyone from the public who saw a flipper tag or a mark could basically query the database and find out basic information like how old an animal is, its sex, um, its reproductive history, if it has tracking data, like a little kind of user interface of like being able to look at the, at the data and zoom in and try different metrics and stuff like that. Um, I would say we're maybe like a couple months away from having the just recite public facing database handy and probably a year away from having the telemetry data in there too. But um, our vision is uh, a program where folks from the public can choose to adopt a seal and basically, um, you know, whether it's for, for children or for, you know, whoever that you get a certificate, you're able to name the seal and then you're able to search that seal's identity. So these would be of the 300 weanlings that we tag every year. Um, you can actually keep track of a single seal and literally watch that seal grow up and see what it does. So that's sort of Patrick Robinson's vision for the adopt a seal program and eventually, you know, be able to look up all the animals as well. So something that we're working on, it's something that'll be on our website um, when it becomes available. So you can check beltronlab.com and uh, maybe by like this summer, we'll have that ready to go. Yeah, it's something we want to do, but actually doing it so that this, the database is safe and not, uh, and also just user-friendly is takes a lot more work than you might think. And so, yeah, as Roxanne said, that's something that we collectively really want to see happen. Uh, do males forage as far as females? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. So I should have shown a comparative map. Um, Sarah Keenly, who is a PhD student in Dan Costa's lab, actually had a paper come out today. Um, and I, maybe I can find the link really quickly, but it's in Royal Society Open Science is the journal. And it's all about um, the differences between male and female elephant seals when they're adults. And, you know, Bernie LaBeouf and Dan Costa have been studying this question for many years, but Sarah sort of took a new look at the data and looked at the risk reward trade-offs of being large and how that sort of um, entices males to go to these completely different places. So we see between the males and the females, um, what we call niche segregation, meaning that the males and females do essentially completely different things where the males are going up, feeding really coastally, um, often along the seafloor on these really large, what we think energy rich fishes, whereas the females are doing exactly the opposite thing, going offshore, feeding in the pelagic on small uh, fishes and some squid. So the males, I think the average distance they travel is farther um, in terms of distance from the colony, but they tend to transit a lot further and then just feed in one place and then kind of come back. Whereas the females will often do these kind of big like circuitous loops when they're finding different feeding areas in the pelagic, because I think the res resources are a little bit more distributed. So um, yeah, one of the main questions of our new NSF grant is figuring out why that niche segregation exists and when it starts. And so hopefully by tracking the, the zero to four year old males and females, we'll be able to see when exactly they start doing those different behaviors and, and how that uh, changes the distances that they have to travel in order to find the food that they need to support their body size. Here's one that'll be good for you. <laughs> How are the local elephant seals different from those we see in Antarctica? Oh, great. And I should say that Roxanne just, uh, we have a book coming out on the behavioral ecology of phocids and Roxanne was one of the authors on the elephant seal chapter, which is both Southern and Northern elephant seals. So she's a very appropriate person to answer the question. Except for the fact that I've never seen a southern elephant seal, so I'm actually just a fraud. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are northern elephant seals and southern elephant seals, and um, you know they're they're different in some like pretty obvious ways in terms of like their anatomy. So like the male southern elephant seals don't have as substantial of um, proboscis as, of noses as the northern elephant seals do. The southern elephant seals are a little bit bigger. Um, and, you know, they tend to forage in areas that can be ice covered in the southern hemisphere. And so that really fundamentally changes the way that they operate, like they have to figure out how to operate in um, either ice free areas or areas where the ice is just receded and there's a lot of prey. So, um, 
they're similar in more ways than you would imagine. Just their, their breeding strategies are very similar. Um, their kind of like diving behavior is very similar. Um, Dan Costa has a graduate student, Teresa Keats, who's doing a comparison of their, I think, at sea foraging metrics for one of her dissertation chapters. And so that I think will be a super cool comparison. But um, there's a lot of interest between Northern Elephant Seal Research Programs and Southern Elephant Seal Research Programs, but we're all busy and don't have enough time to get together. So we were joking with the Southern Elephant Seal folks that we were going to have some sort of conference when the pandemic is over to finally sort out the similarities and differences between Northern and Southern Elephant Seals. So um, we'll have to let you know in a couple of years what comes out of that. One of my favorite things is the comment about when the Southern Elephant Seal researchers and Northern Elephant Seal researchers are getting together, they talk about which one is more attractive. <laughs> They're like, you only love your kids, right? I mean, what is more attractive? It's all relative. I think most people who are not elephant seal researchers would absolutely not call elephant seals attractive. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, what happens when a seal molts? Do you just paint the seal tag again? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, so elephant seals have what we call a catastrophic molt. And I don't know who named it that, but it was pretty brilliant. It is literally catastrophic, where, you know, most mammals and like, birds molts feathers or fur it's like pretty standard across the animal uh, kingdom but elephant seals and a couple other species of seals do this catastrophic molt where they literally lose not just their fur um, but also their skin <laughs> it just like peels off in chunks I should have put a picture in my talk oh my god my husband Patrick is bringing me pieces of elephant seal fur <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like you can kind of see the inside this literally just like peels off of the seals. It's just incredible. And then you're walking on the beach full of like pieces of molted fur. Um, so we try to mark them right after the molt because that's when the mark will stay on for an entire year. Um, but thankfully their flipper tags, you know, stay in throughout the molting process before, during and after and for many, many years. So we just use that flipper tag to continuously remark them with the same marks over and over and over again. But it's such a simple process, the marking process, and it, it really doesn't disturb them too much. So we don't mind doing it year after year. It's just the thing that happens right after the molt and, and uh, that is what it is. But I will say that the molt is probably the most understudied life history event in the animal kingdom. And I'm very excited about it. And at some point I would really like to figure out exactly how long it takes and, you know, what the skin temperature does throughout the molt and how that influences the healing process for like these adult males who are getting into these epic battles and you know, getting their chest shields all bloody, they have to heal that somehow. And I think a lot of that healing happens during the molt and that may be why seals molt in the first place. So lots of interesting questions there. So another good question we can answer now is, do the seals from San Simeon colony forage in the same region as the Anya Nuevo seals? Yeah, you wanna take that, Dan? You're much more familiar with Sarah's dissertation than me. Yeah, we, we've tagged animals at all the major colonies all the way down off Mexico from San Nicolas Island, uh, some from San Simeon to Año Nuevo. And the majority of the animals, they, they may start a little further south, but they all tend to forage in the same places. The difference is the animals off Mexico, about half of them stay off Mexico and the rest of them come all the way up here to uh, up in the North Pacific where, the, where our elephant seals go. So it wasn't what we expected, but they all tend to have uh, very similar foraging patterns, the females. Um, okay, here's a good one. Do other kinds of seals also have similar lifestyles with breeding colonies and long migrations? <laughs> this is such a Dan Costa question. Look how happy he is. <laughs> We have a book on this that's coming out <laughs> next month. Go for it, Dan. It'll bring you more joy than me. Uh, elephant seals are the extreme example of a, of a true seal. Everything they do, when I talk about elephant seals, I'd say that they are the most extreme example. They have the longest migrations. They have the longest fasting. Everything they do is really extreme. And so they're on the far limit and all the other seals are sort of on, on this side of that in terms of uh, less extreme, but yeah, it's a, I mean, I'm joking about, we really do have a book that's coming out uh, next month on Fossid seals where we really describe all of these different patterns and, and it, it she, you, you couldn't get, I could spend a lot of time talking about it. So I'll just stop there and say, it's, it's a great question 
and a lot of us have spent a lot of time thinking about it. It's also just really remarkable what elephants seals do relative to other marine mammals. They just travel so far in such a straight line getting where they're going. And it's interesting from a navigation perspective. It's interesting from like a nutrient transport perspective. It's interesting from a predator prey interaction perspective. Um, there's a lot of work that I think needs to be done that Dan and I have talked a lot about doing about comparing terrestrial and marine systems and like the migration patterns that come out of those different systems. And elephant seals seem to be this like extraordinary example of uh, an animal that can store enough fat to be able to travel those long distances. And I think part of the reason that that's possible is that gravity doesn't operate on aquatic animals in the same way that it does on terrestrial animals, because, you know, the buoyancy helps them deal with that. But imagine, you know, any of the migrating animals that travel super far, a lot of them are birds and they're smaller body size and they can't store as much fat. They just literally wouldn't be able to fly. So by being in the marine environment, elephant seals and, and by transiting, you know, by swimming, not by walking or by flying, elephant seals have a real advantage in terms of being able to travel far. And so um, that's part of the reason that their migrations are so extraordinary compared to lots of other mammals and birds. A question that came up about sea mounts. I heard another UCSC talk about seals and they knew locations of sea mounts for shallower feeding. Is this the same for elephant seals? <laughs> you can pass the mic over to Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, Sarah Maxwell, right, was the kind of original, had the original interest in that question. She was a PhD student in Dan's lab a long time ago, is now a professor at the University of Washington, I think. Um, and she was really interested in seamounts because seamounts are aggregating features for prey. They, you know, do crazy things to the oceanography that basically like attract a bunch of lower trophic level organisms, which therefore cascade up the food webs to have these consequences for uh, top predators that's the theory and you know there have been videos of feeding aggregations on seamounts but very little work done on actually you know using biologgers or trackers to figure out if that's truly the case and so Sarah I think came on as a PhD student was like I'm going to write a dissertation on seamounts and elephant seals use of seamounts and how many was it Dan like two out of a hundred use seamounts <laughs> and they use seamounts some of them did and I think they were pretty successful at doing it but it's certainly not like a strategy that um, is used commonly. I've seen in at least two of the weanling dive records that they're doing flat bottom dives out in the ocean, which suggests they're finding a seafloor, which probably means given the shallowness of the dives that it's a seamount somewhere. So there's some evidence that elephant seals use them, but um, you know, they're not like a one-stop shop for elephant seals that will cause them to stop migrating across the North Pacific to these incredible foraging grounds. They seem to be just kind of like a one-off thing. If a seal finds a seamount, it might use it. It might not continue to use it the next year. It seems to be more common in southern elephant seals, and I think that's because there's more seamounts in the southern ocean than in the North Pacific. Yeah. So here's a question for, from Doris Welch, who worked with us some years ago. Have you been able to determine what actually triggers them to awaken from their sleep in the deep to surface in, is it in time for air? Is it simply CO2 buildup or lack of oxygen? I'll let you tackle the physiology side of that, but I'll just say from the ecology side that our colleagues have video recorders attached to seals and video of seals falling asleep, drifting down in the water column, hitting the bottom and not waking up. So I think they are really like sleeping with both hemispheres of their brain and not waking up very easily, but um, they certainly do wake up somehow. So Dan, what do you think about the physiology of that? But what I'll say is I'll pass that off to our other colleagues, Gita McDonald, who's on the faculty at Moss Landing Marine Lab, Paul Panganis, who was a student here years ago, uh, are really focusing on exactly that question. What are the triggers that, uh, what's the, the fundamental mechanistic physiology that, that drives, uh, that, that makes these dives possible? And so that is a, an area of active research. And those guys are developing some pretty amazing instrumentation that allows us to measure blood oxygen levels during a dive, uh, working on muscle, uh, oxygen levels during a dive. And ultimately what we'd like to do is measure blood lactate levels during a dive. We haven't gotten there yet, but one of the things that's so fantastic about the elephant seal program and, and the ability to, for us at UC Santa Cruz is we've been able to collaborate with some of the best people in the business and they come and work with us and we get to be have the vicarious uh, ability to work with people who are much smarter than us 
and apply all these really great instruments that we would have had uh, no other opportunity to work with. So lots of great uh, people really enjoyed the talk. There's been a number of, pres of comments about people who were here in the 70s working with LaBeouf, uh, others that, that have just commented that they've been uh, at Año Nuevo. Uh, here's a, here's a, another good question. When females are hunting, are hustling back, do they swim in a dive and surface pattern or in a straight line? Such a good question. Um, the short answer is that they dive. And the long answer is, you know, there's lots of hypotheses as to why they do that. They're called transit dives. So um, in our sort of program, we use a dive typing code that Patrick created in MATLAB that basically sorts all dives into four options. The pelagic feeding dives, which I showed you, the drift resting dives, which I showed you, um, benthic dives, which I talked about, which are not very common except for right along the coast. And then uh, what's the other one? <laughs> uh, transit dives. So the transit dives are very different from the other types of dives in that they don't have these like wiggles at the bottom. Like the seals are not trying to find food. It's not a drift dive. They're not like, you know, not moving any of their like flippers. They're, they're, they're doing something different. And so we think that they're transiting underwater for potentially a couple of reasons. One is to save energy. So it's really costly to swim right at the surface of the water. That's why you see like dolphins uh, doing what we call porpoising, right? Where they'll like come up and then go down, come up and then go down. They're basically trying to not experience that crazy amount of drag that happens right at the surface of the ocean. Um, there's also a hypothesis that transiting underwater might actually help the seals navigate if they're using geomagnetic cues. So you know, the Earth's surface is down below the water. And so the closer that the seals get to the seafloor, in theory, the closer they're getting to that source of magnetic information. So they could also be using that as well. But um, I think it's very rare for us to see them sort of swimming at the surface with the exception of, you know, we'll see like the sea otters that are out in the kelp forest. Sometimes they just kind of like sit there and catch their breath and kind of swim around a little bit. But um, for the elephant seals, I think they're pretty much on a mission and they like to do as little as possible at the surface to avoid that predation pressure by the white sharks and killer whales that are basically like silhouetting the seals um, to the sunlight on the ocean surface. Yeah, we're getting, I think we're supposed to sign off at seven. So I'll give a, a last question or two. Uh, you're going to love this one. Uh, this one's perfect. I'm, uh, whip, I put, here we go. I, I have too many questions in front of me, sorry. Do the pups tend to follow the migration patterns of their mothers slash fathers? This is a paper that we're gonna write as soon as this field season ends and we can breathe again. Um, yeah, the question is, you know, basically is there heritability of navigation? Because we know for a fact that elephant seals are not getting like learned information from their moms because their moms literally leave the beach before the pups ever get in the water. And then the pups are two months delayed from their moms in terms of going out for that first foraging trip. Um, and so there's clearly no learned information, but there could be genetic information. There could be some innate navigation sense, whether it's a specific location or whether it's a route. Um, that was actually the question that I posed for my postdoc fellowship proposals. And it's a question that I worked with Dan and Patrick on for a couple of years, and now Joffrey is finishing and publishing. And um, basically, when the seals are young, they're doing just fundamentally different things than the adults anyways. They're definitely not following their mom's routes because they're going coastal like the males do. And we think that's probably a high risk, high reward strategy due to their lack of physiological capabilities, their lack of diving abilities. And that's probably what results in them having higher mortality rates. But when those daughters become adult females, the question is, do they take the same routes or go to the same places as their adult moms? And there's now something like 34 sets of mothers and their adult daughters who've now been tracked as part of Dan's program. And we are actively targeting, um, you know, adult females who were born to adult females that were instrumented back in the day so that we can test this question and um, again, I don't want to give the story away, but I will just say that there's no clear evidence that um, daughters are doing anything more similar to their moms than to random seals, which implies that their sense of navigation or their foraging routes are not heritable. And instead, there's something else driving it. So whether that's random chance and a strategy that, you know, just happens to work out or 
um, whether they're following some other animals. I, I don't know what the alternative uh, hypotheses would be, but um, it does not look like there's a very strong uh, link between where the mom goes and where the pup goes as an adult. So I think we'll finish with this last question, which is really a combination of two. And the questions are, do animals from different colonies ever wind up here? And that the other part of that, the second question, is our elephant seal colonies extending further north to population growth or any other reason? So those are kind of related <laughs> questions. Yeah, so the seals, we, let's see. So the program in contacts with all the other programs is that the Anya Nuevo colony is very, very, very extensively studied, has been for a very long time. We use green filter tags. There are other programs that have, you know, amazing other capabilities, like the Friends of the Elephant Seal program at um, Piedras Blancas that has this incredible docent program that interprets to, I'm sure, you know, hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. And um, the Piedras Blancas seals get white flipper tags. And then the San Nicolas elephant seals get red flipper tags. And the Point Reyes females get, or seals get pink flipper tags. So we can tell which colony the seals came from based on the color of their flipper tag because there's a lot of coordination that happens across colonies in order to figure out where they come from and where they're going. Um, and they disperse a lot more when they're young. We think, you know, they're kind of prospecting and trying to figure out if they maybe want to go to a different colony or whether they should stay at Año Nuevo. So we see a lot of, um, for example, white tags at Año Nuevo. We're seeing a whole bunch of them right now on juveniles. So those are seals that literally came from um, Peter Blancas were tagged as weanlings and then are kind of exploring Año Nuevo during their sort of formative juvenile years. But that's all stuff we keep track of. So every day we go out for recites, we're recording, you know, the color of the flipper tag. So which place they came from um, and also where they go. And there's a lot of interesting research, I think, that can come out of that. Um, you know, the elephant seal population history is that there were only about 20 individuals down in Mexico and they've been expanding northward ever since. And so it's both a range re-expansion um, in terms of expanding to areas where they were before this sort of population bottleneck due to, to human hunting. But also, um, there's just more seals. There's 220,000 seals now out of the 20. That was that historical population number. And so the seals have to go somewhere. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that the Año Nuevo colony may be at carrying capacity. Um, Rachel Holzer just published a nice paper in Proceedings Beyond That. And um, some of the colonies up north are getting more and more animals. So Don Goley and Emma Levy and others are working um, from Humboldt State at the Kings Range Colony, which is along the Lost Coast in Northern California. And basically, you know, they were able to get tags and marks out on the first sets of seals that sort of prospected that area. And now it's a, it's a real breeding colony with, you know, handfuls of females that are producing pup and they're getting tags on all those pups. So it's really cool to see those expansions. We get reports of elephant seals and like, Oregon and Washington, and I think sometimes even Canada. Um, so they're definitely doing some expanding, but where they'll stop, I think no one knows. All right, and the, the thing I'll, number of people asked about Año Nuevo and visiting Año Nuevo, and I'll just say that state parks, you can go up there. This time of year, you probably need a reservation. You might get lucky if you just showed up, but they have a limited uh, number of slots and it's all guided tours. And other people are interested in Roxanne's program, you can go to her website and find out more about it and uh, see about volunteering. And at that, uh, thank you for all the great questions. Roxanne, you gave a phenomenal talk. Uh, really appreciate it. And this was really fun for me as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan and Roxanne, for sharing this important research with us. And we look forward to seeing Roxanne, Rafe and I do, both look forward to seeing Roxanne later tonight on uh, PBS. For those of you in, in uh, Northern and Central California, that's Channel 9 KQED on most uh, cable channels. And for our audience, please join us for our next Craw Lecture, From Healthy Whales to Healthy Oceans, on February 16th with Professor of o Ocean Sciences, Ari S. Friedlander. Good night, everybody. Good night.